नमस्कार आई एम डॉक्टर अनुजा आई एम अ फैकल्टी इन स्कूल ऑफ सोशल साइंसेज जवाहरलाल नेहरू यूनिवर्सिटी फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक एच आर डी सी जे एन यू फॉर गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी फॉर डिलीवरिंग अ लेक्चर ऑन द कंटेम्प्ररी इशू दैट इज जेंडो द टॉपिक ऑफ टूडेज लेक्चर विच इज गोइंग टू बी हाफ एन आवर विथ यू ऑल दैट इट इज जेंडर डिस्कोर्स इन इंडिया अंडरस्टैंडिंग इंटरसेक्शनैलिटी अप्रोच so before starting with the lecture here i would be dealing with two important key principles of gender perspectives one is known as construction of gender that you can say it's a social construction of gender and other is intersectionality approach so dealing one by one with both the concept is social construction what exactly it means and what social construction of gender means so later social constructivist proposed that there is no inherent truth to gender it is constructed by social experiences and gender performances so the social construction of gender comes out of the general school of thought that is known as social constructionism so what social constructionism is it is basically which proposes the everything that people know or see as a reality is partially if not extremely or entirely socially situated so it is conceptually created and sub conceptually clear that social construction of gender is that where society basically helps you to decide and assign role of any particular individual to say that something is socially constructed does not mean mitigated the power of the concept so a social constructionist view of gender looks beyond the categories and examines the intersection of multiple identities so i will be dealing with this multiple identities where it is basically called intersectionality approach so now i will move towards what exactly the word gender is known as because it is in a debate in a contemporary time that what is gender we loosely use this term everywhere it is not that sociology it is not that economics it is not that political science which uses this concept this concept is used universally and it is very important for all of us to know what exactly the word gender is it is basically a new as a concept and is a being basically used in sociologically which has a specific meaning it is also said that it is a tool to analyze analyze the social realities with regard to women and men both so it is very important to note that when we talk about gender it doesn't mean that it is talking about one particular sex one particular gender that is women but it talks about women and men both so now we want to know that what exactly gender is so gender basically refers to the socio cultural definition of man and woman the way societies basically distinguish men and women and assign the roles in the society to them this is basically very important and when we talk about that earlier it was basically believed that these roles these attributes these characteristics basically women and men the assigned roles and characteristics given by the society was it was determined by the biology and this biology is basically is that is sex so which in a sense was hypothetical that women were basically subordinate because of their bodies which is natural and unchangeable so quote and quote over here when we talk that it is biological it means it is natural so the natural is that women bodies ability talks about that it is not changeable so when women are said to be subordinate it means that 
her subordination is natural and it is unchangeable. Here the question of gender injustice and the question of gender inequality has no space as the above facts were already accepted by the society itself. But here it is very important to understand that gender as a concept is one thing and sex is another. So making generalization about the subordination and denomination or domination about out of bodies ability is absolutely wrong. So we need to understand the difference between both things that is sex and that is gender. So when we'll come to the differences we will try to understand what exactly sex is. Sex we said it is natural but where we talk about gender it is socio-cultural and man-made. So when we say is that sex is natural it means it is not changeable. It cannot be changed and when we talk about gender that is man-made it means that it can be changed. So now when we say that sex is biological then it is in gender it is not when we talk about sex it is a biological it means it is ascribed that you have got from your birth but in gender it refers to masculine feminine qualities so the behavior patterns and roles and responsibilities changes that you achieve after getting birth so now the other thing which is very important regarding sex and gender differentiation here is that it is constant. So we say that sex is constant and remains the same everywhere. So the girl born in India will be girl born in America as well. Her sex is not going to change. So her sex is going to be the similar what is in India and what is in America. But the thing is different with the gender. It is variable. It changes from time to time. It changes from culture to culture and it changes from family to family. So when we talk about gender, it means it is not that what sex is. So unlike sex, what we say that gender is man-made and social and social society basically transforms a male and a female into a man and a woman and into a masculine and feminine. I'm sure it is def definitely propping in your mind, it is coming into your mind about the question that how a man and a female is transformed into the masculine and a feminine. This answer is going to be uh, dealt a bit in the coming points. First of all, it is very important to know that this, the concept gender, who has brought in the limelight. Anne Oakley, who is also the first feminist scholar to use this concept, says that gender is a matter of culture. It refers to the social classification of men and women into masculine and feminine. So a person is a male or a female can be identified or judged by their biological evidences, but a person is a masculine and a feminine cannot be identified by the biological evidences. So she refuted the connection between what sex and gender are. Actually, what she says that these sex and gender are not really natural at all. So now the question that we, it was coming into the mind that how males and females turned into masculine and feminine. So it is very important to know over here that this happens through a process of gendering. So what gendering is? It is basically a packaging done by girls and boys from birth onwards. And this is also known as socialization. So this socialization process is the basically it is done by the agents and the sources and that is the family. First and foremost agent of socialization is our family. According to Kamala Bhaseen, the specific process of socialization basically which teaches children their gender roles is called gender indoctrination. So now what Kamala Bhaseen said that gendering is, it has few processes. 
it passes through processes in gender socialization. So we need to know how this gender socialization is taking place. So according to Ruth Hurtley, she says that socialization basically takes place through four processes. And these processes are normally differentiated by sex and all are features of the child's socialization from the birth only. And these four processes of socialization, what we call gender socialization is manipulation, canalization, verbal appellation and active exposure. So now we will deal with all these four processes one by one. So what are the process of gender socialization is done? So we start with the manipulation. As the name itself says that it is molding, is meant the way you handle your child, the way you handle your infant, the way you take care of your boys and girls at home. So how you treat your boy. You treat your boy as a strong, you treat your boy as autonomous and you treat your boy as a brave in the family. But the girls are often said that how pretty you are, how soft you are. So all these physical experiences in early childhood are very important in shaping the self-perception of girls and boys. So now we, move, we will move towards from manipulation to canalization. Here this canalization basically talks about children's attention towards the gender appropriate objects. Now what this gender appropriate objects are? You are familiarizing your children with particular objects and that is gender specific. So the interest of girls and boys can be different. So you are introducing some toys to boys which they basically want to play and that is a machine, a car or a gun. But when you give a toy to a girl to play is a doll, is a tea set or a house. So here you are introducing gender appropriate objects to introduce to your children. So the interest of girls and boys are basically channelized differently. So with this differential treatment and they develop with these different capabilities, attitudes and the aspiration and dreams in future. Now from the canalization we move to the verbal appellation and that consists of telling children what they are and what expectations are from them. So when we talk about verbal appellation it means you are talking about boys that you are strong. As I have already mentioned earlier that manipulation was one thing where you also molding your child and here in verbal appellation also you are telling them that you are strong. And girls you are submissive, you have to be prim and proper. So these expectations are developed by the family itself. So such remarks basically are coming from where it is the self-identity of girls and it is the self-identity of the boys from where the family constantly transmit these aspects and specifically to the gender role and convey the importance of each child. So moving to the last uh, aspect of uh, gender socialization is active exposure. Here the family basically tries to do what? Basically they familiarize with gender appropriate tasks and earlier in canalization we said it was gender appropriate objects. Here what exactly family do? They introduce the boys and girls with the gender appropriate task. So the girls for an example you can take are said that you can help your mother at your home with her household and household chorus. And you say to the boys that you can accompany your father in the field or into the business. So through all these processes, children imbibe the meaning of masculine and feminine and internalize them unconsciously. 
So whatever it is coming into their being, it is just because of all these socialization with all these sources that we have socialized through the family itself. So now we'll move it to that how these gender socialization takes place. There are many such sources, there are many such agencies or agents that help in social construction of gender. So first and foremost, I have already talked, it is a family. It starts from family itself. So family is basically considered as the institution that has the greatest impact on gender socialization. So the parents usually hold a number of gender stereotype, which are the ideas about how a girl and a boy should act and think. So in the same way, when the children move from family to peer groups, there also they have a specific gender roles. They find their own group. Girls find their own peer groups. Boys find their own peer groups. So here again, the way of social construction of gender is in that way. So now we, when we move to the other thing, other sources and other agents of construction of gender, here the next environment that children are entering is the school where conscious socialization is happening and schools are the major context for gender socialization. So when we move to school to uh, we go to the workplaces there also it is very important to understand that how social construction of gender is being talked about. So how gender socialization is talked about. So when we talk about the workplace, the assignment of tasks are based on workers' sex. So those who can, who are powerful, those who are strong, gets more different type of work. So the higher value placed on men's work than women's, it is said in the workplace. So this is the way how gender socialization at the workplace takes place. So for an example, I can give one thing, the sexual division of labor. This sexual division of labor is a part and assigning the different task of men and women. When you talk about different work, different group, it means that for men it is different, for women it is different. So here again, the social construct of gender is different and the gender socialization of a men and a women is different. Same way you can take an example of media where advertising company, the newspapers, everywhere, even the literature and in the religion how the social construction of gender takes place. So everything is apart and everything is there. So first of all it is very important to know that we need to ask ourselves that why this gender matters, why it is so important, why we are talking too much about gender, gender and gender, why it is too much in a debate, why it is talked about here in the contemporary context so much. So Amy S. Wharton basically in her book she talks about the sociology of gender where she says that gender one of the organizing principles. It is one of the organizing principle of the social world. So this organizing principle basically organizes your identities, your self-concepts, your structure. And it is also this organizing principles which helps you to interact and interaction upon which power resources are allocated. Therefore, society basically allocate appropriate roles and activities for gender and it is socially and culturally constructed as it is said earlier in the lecture that how social construction of gender is taking place it is because the society is assigning a role to the individual and it is said to be socially and culturally constructed it is gender which has determined that Everywhere women are considered to be inferior I'm, and to the men, in fact. So when we talk about the subordination of women, it is said that women 
at every stream, every phase, every life, everywhere, all walks of life, in all stream, everywhere, women are facing subordination. So now, what exactly that means? It means that women enjoy fewer rights. They have fewer control over resources. They work for a longer time than men, but their work is undervalued. Their work is underpaid. So these resources, these underpaid, undervalued work, which women are not getting equally like men, gives to the way of unequal distribution of power. We talk about discrimination. We talk about exclusion. We talk about inequality as a whole. So these unequal distribution of power, unequal distribution of resources leads to inequality and discrimination and of course exclusion and remains barrier to human development. So neither sex nor nature is responsible for this inequality and neither sex nor nature is responsible for the unjustifiable inequalities that exist between women and men and a gender which brings binary. This is what gender is. So sex to some extent is not that brings inequality. It is the society which is assigning you a role that talks about the binaries here. So when we talk about other inequalities beyond gender in society, for instance, you can talk about the caste, you can talk about the classes. There are many other things you can talk about ethnicity, you can talk about races and so and so forth. We see that these all are man-made. They are historically constructs and therefore they can be questioned, they can be challenged, they can be changed. So when we talk about the historical construct, it means history needs to be noted and learned and it has to be thought about. When we talk about history, it is his story. So it is very important to know her story as well to change the perception of the society. So it is very important to understand the con connection that connected with the gender and sex and gender and gender relations. So what gender and gender relations we talk about? It is basically there is matter of power. So the gender relation refers to the relations of power between whom? It is women and men, which can be seen in a range of practices ideas, their representation in political arena, their representation in economic field, their representation in social field as well, including the division of labor, roles and resources. So like gender, gender relations are also not the same and static in every society. Why I am saying this so? Because what gender relations and power it is in Indian society could be different in other society as well. For an example, we can take Margaret Mead's study. She talked about three primitive society in her book that is Sex and Temperament. She said she studied in Papua New Guinea and she said that these three primitive societies were basically based on the gender relationships and gender roles and which also says that how these tribes, three tribes are Arapes, Mundugumur and Shambri, that they so basically based on not only on the roles and it is fixed with the roles. So taking with the first tribe that is Arapes, what is said? The temperament of both male and female are exactly similar where we talked about earlier that gender socialization when we do we introduce our children with the gender appropriate object gender appropriate task so here what exactly in arape tribe margaret mead has seen she saw that it is 
the temperament of both male and female it is similar it is gentle it is responsive it is cooperative so the gender socialization of both the sexes are in a similar way so now we'll come to the other tribe that is mung mundugumur and that is also known as bivard these days and here both male and female were violent both of them were seeking for the power so again we can see that social construction of gender here and the socialization is done in a similar way now when we talk about the shambli which is now known as chambri is where you can see the temperament of male is different from the temperament of female the male is submissive they are more emotional and dependent whereas women are into managerial roles so they are very important examples given by margaret mee here we can say that one can generalize and say in the most society these gender relations are not equal and equitable so now when we move to the indian society we say that indian society has been extremely multilayered with the existence of many other factors like class caste urban rural divide and which means that with these multilayered aspects there is inequality and the abuse faced by women differ due to the intersects of two or more of these categories so the gender violence is often not only gender related crime but a combined effort of various other factors including all these aspects that is caste it could be class it could be race it could be religion so multiple identities basically tend to push women to extreme fringes and make them more vulnerable to discrimination in terms of access to basic human resources rights and opportunities and etc so now how would you situate i can give you an example here when we talk about the multi layered system in a indian society so how you situate a trans dalit muslim women especially when her identity is basically it's based on what her identity is intersected by factors such as poverty disability or her status of being a migrant should her identity be identified or defined by one of the widely accepted social construct such as caste gender or religion or class she would not qualify because as women and men because why owing to her non conformity of her sex of her gender binaries moreover being poor her access to essential public services would be marred with the challenges due to her complex trans status so this is basically an example what exactly it is in indian society and why we talk about the social construction of gender here the construct is like how we understand intersectionality so intersectionality is a feminist theory which can be used as an analytical tool to study and understand the convergence of multiple identities of with a gender and to respond appropriately to elevate the discrimination against oppressed classes so this term was basically used by kimberly renshaw in 1989 where she said that she used the term to describe how gender is with race with class with other many other factors play a role in operation faced by an individual so the concept of intersectionality basically started pioneering from the black feminist in the united states and united kingdom on the hierarchical nature of inequality and dominance so what we exactly want to say here that intersectionality origin from the second wave of feminism 
because in second wave of feminism the color women was somewhere neglected and this was taken in the third wave of feminism so what is intersectionality then it is intersectionality we say it is a feminist theory it is a methodology of research so we can give an example very nicely when we say that intersectionality is an analytical tool for studying understanding and responding to the ways in which gender basically intersects with other identities and how these intersections contribute to unique experience of oppression and privileges so now it is very uh, nicely said that at the same time it is privilege at the same time it is oppression also for example a poor man who is also white and gay here what you exactly see when a boy when a man is a white it means he has an area of privilege but when we say that he is poor and he is gay it means it is a matter of oppression in a similar way the other example you can take of a black woman who is highly educated who is highly uh, able to body and young again what you see here because she is a woman she is a black she is oppressed and because she is highly educated and young and able body she is privileged so at the same time both oppression and privilege are there in intersectionality so the intersectionality theory basically argues what it argues violence never and does not occur in isolation there are several intersecting factors such as identities and institutions that contribute to gender based violence indeed at the level of theory intersectionality has transformed how gender is discussed it is an urgent use and urgent issue for all the researchers to investigate into this and with this the researcher can promote to the positive social change in a society and from this a human being can be treated as equal so intersectionality perspective emphasizes that an individual's social identity exerts particularly influences on individual's belief and experience of gender making it is essential to understand that gender within the context of power relation i was talking about intersectionality in as a whole but there are many examples of intersectionality in indian context as well here the term intersectionality recently been imported into india and in indian academia but the notion of multiple identities co-constructing marginalities has been consistently apparent on the socio economic and political canvas on india and of india since ages from the early 20th century onwards the non brahmanical movements in tamil nadu to the dalit literary and autobiographic up upsurges in maharashtra in 1960s to the continuous episodes of honor killing and atrocities all these illustrate the various complex ways in which caste gender and also class intersect to shape the identity of a person there are many prominent social reformers and thinkers of 19th century in india like jyotirao phule ev ramasamy periyar and dr bhim rao ambedkar who talks about gender and discrimination and where the intersection of other particular aspects are also there we talks about the marginalities which shaped one's socio economic reality so we what we see in the intersectionality perspective we see that to understand this intersectionality perspective is specially it is relevant to enhance those research methods that seem to be least amenable to adopting it if one adopts an intersectionality perspective one will look into the research problems from that perspective and also develop research strategy strategies and enables one to develop answers to the questions 
So this is what we understand and how gender intersects with various cultural and social concepts and understand ourselves and the world and culture we live in. Thank you.